Good evening, Two Rivers. I hope you came ready to worship because tonight is a night of worship.
Tonight I have the pleasure of singing a song with you guys that has such a timely theme and it's called Revivals in the Air. And in the last couple of weeks we've seen this word revival just being thrown around so often and that made me realize that there is some misconception about what revival actually means. So I went to look it up, the definition of the word revival I'd like to share with you guys tonight. Revival means an improvement in the condition or strength of something. An instance of something becoming popular, active, or important again. It means comeback, improvement, reestablishment. And I used to think that revivals meant large gatherings where people would come hungry for God and where the move of the Spirit would happen and we will have signs and wonders and miracles. And not to say that revival isn't about that, it is, but it's not just that. Revival may look a little bit different for me and for you. Revival may look like a prodigal son coming home. Revival can look like 
a person is struggling with addiction that breaks the chains and the bondage of sin. Revival can look like marriage being restored. Revival can look like dead things coming back to life. And what if I were to tell you today that you don't have to drive for hours to go to a certain place to experience revival. You don't have to catch a plane and go to the church XYZ to experience revival. What if I were to tell you that God can do a revival in your life right here, right now. He can do a revival in your life. He can bring things that are dead back to life if you will just let him. If you will just surrender. If you just let him. Revival is in the air. Amen.
I punted every leisure activity in my life. Nothing, no weekends, no vacations, zero, nothing, all in. Any goal that you want to achieve that's worthwhile in your life require all in effort. If you have this burning desire inside of you, then you just need to go full force and block out all the negativity and everything else that is around you telling you that you can't do it. Come on, God, say all in. All in. All in. All in. By any means necessary. Let's go. Well. Who's glad to be in church today? I'm so happy to be able to be with you. My name is Will, and I want to take a second and greet all of our locations in New York and the great state of Pennsylvania, every one of our extension sites, and then everybody join us online. Church, can we put our hands together and make everybody that's joining us feel welcome, make them feel loved? Well, I'm excited because we're coming out of All Access Weekend, and it was an amazing time, a family gathering. It was so great to be with all of you. And I'm encouraged because God is moving. I know that God is calling people and leading people. We're a multiplying movement. It's exciting to be able to gather in that way. Well, today we are continuing in our series entitled All In. Turn to your neighbor, say All In. Now turn in your Bibles with me to 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 21. We're going to camp out in just one verse today. If you get your Bibles out, if you don't have it, you can download 
the YouVersion Bible app on your phone and, and, and join along with us. They're going to put it up, as always, on the screen where you can follow along and you can get your notes. You can take out your notes. And on the back side of, of the brochure, there's a place that, that you can write down your notes and, and follow along with us. Well, in this series, I want to kind of recap why we're doing this series. And to do that, I want to jump all the way back to the 16th century where Nicholas Copernicus challenged the belief that the earth was the center of the universe. It's called the Copernican Revolution, and it turned the scientific world upside down by turning the universe inside out. In much the same way, each of us needs to experience our own Copernican Revolution. The paradigm shift that happens when we come to terms with the fact that the world does not revolve around us. See, the problem is that when we're born as babies, every time we cry, what happens? Somebody comes to respond every time we wear our diapers, every time we have a need. Somebody, and we're reinforced over and over again that we, I, am the center of the universe. And that's fine if you're a six-month-old baby, but when you're 22, it's a problem. And so here's a news flash. Everybody look right at me. I want you to hear this. You are not the center of the universe. At its core, sinfulness is selfishness. It's enthroning yourself, your desires and your needs and your plans above everything else. You may seek God, but you don't seek him first. And so for so many, faith is less about serving his purpose, and it's more about him serving our purposes. Many think they're following Jesus, but the reality is this. They have invited Jesus to follow them. They call him Savior, but have never surrendered to follow him as Lord. And as we continue in our series today, let me ask the question, who is following who? Are you following Jesus or have you inverted the gospel by inviting him to follow you? And it's very possible that you've bought in, but you have not sold out. My greatest concern as a pastor is that people can go to church every week of their lives and never go all in for Jesus. They can follow the rules, but never follow Jesus. And you've cheapened the gospel if you think you can buy in, but never sell out. If it's convenient and comfortable all the time, something is wrong. People can have just enough of Jesus to be bored, but not enough to feel the holy surge of adrenaline that comes when you decide to follow him no matter what, no matter where, no matter when. Well, as we turn in the word to 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 21, we set up this picture where Elijah, one of the great prophets of Israel, comes and he puts his cloak on Elisha. It's an invitation to become the prophet's apprentice. Elisha would have a front row seat to all that God is doing in Israel. And we find Elisha's response in 1 Kings 19.21. Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people. And they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. Today I want to challenge you to take a page from Elisha and remove plan B. Let's pray. God, I pray that you're going to help us to hear your words, to surrender our kingdoms, our convenience, our comfort, and follow you first and only. Lord, I pray that you'll illuminate our hearts and reveal our true intentions in the light of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today I want to talk to you about burning the ships. That's the title of today's message, burn the ships. Write that down in your notes and then... Lean in. 
In 1519, Spanish explorer Hernán Cortés set sail for Mexico with 11 ships, 13 horses, 110 sailors, and 553 sailors, or soldiers. The indigenous population was 5 million people. From a mathematical standpoint, the odds were stacked against him by a ratio of 7,541 to 1. Two prior expeditions to the New World had failed, yet Cortez managed to conquer much of the South American continent. What Cortez is reported to have done after landing is, de- is a defining moment. He issued the order that turned the mission into an all-or-nothing proposition. He said, burn the ships. As his crew watched their fleet of ships burn and sink, they came to terms with the fact that retreat was not an option. And if you can, for just a couple moments, compartmentalize the moral conundrum of colonization, there's a lesson to be learned. Nine times out of ten, failure is resorting to plan B when plan A gets too risky, too costly, or too difficult. And that's why most people are living their plan B. They didn't burn the ships. Plan A people don't have a plan B. It's plan A or bust. They'd rather crash and burn going after their God-ordained dreams than succeed as something else. There are moments in life when we need to burn the ships to our past. We do so by making a defining decision that will eliminate the possibility of sailing back to our old lives. We need defining moments where we go all in and burn the ships. Some of us, we're so stuck on our past failures, it's time to burn the ships. Some of us are focused on our our past successes. Maybe you're looking at the bad habits in your life, the addiction Burn the ships, regret and guilt. It's time to burn the ships to my old way of life. Elisha made a defining decision and put action to it. He burned the plows. It was his way of burning the ships. He barbecued his oxen and threw a party for his friends. And at this bonfire that had to have lasted into the night, Elisha served notice to everyone that the old Elisha was through. The bonfire symbolized the last day of his old life and the first day of his new one. It was the end of Elisha the farmer and the beginning of Elisha the prophet. And it doesn't matter if you're trying to lose weight, to get into grad school, write a book, start a business, get out of debt, or kick your addiction. The first step is always the longest and the hardest. You can't just take a step into the future. You have to eliminate the possibility of going backward into the past. This is how you go after your goals. This is how you break addiction. This is how you reconcile relationships. Leave the past by burning the ships. It's time to start a new chapter. And when you begin a new chapter... You have to end the old one. You have to finish with a period, not a comma. There's got to be no turning back. If his prophetic apprenticeship didn't turn out, Elisha had no place to turn. So many make commitments at all access. Just over this past weekend, there there were moments where you felt God calling you into your tomorrow. And i got to encourage you to start a new chapter of your life. You have to close the old chapter. You can't put a comma where God is putting a period. You're going to have to use a period. So don't let the last chapter keep you from succeeding in your next chapter. Elisha's example of burning the plows serves not only as a period, but also as a statement of faith. Elisha didn't need to burn the plowing equipment to follow Elijah, but he did it to make a statement. More specifically, it was a statement of faith. It was Elisha's all-in moment. Elisha wasn't just buying in, he was selling out. 
And that's what going all in is all about. So I'm asking you, have you made a statement of faith? I'm not talking about repeating a sinner's prayer or coming to next steps or even joining a small group. Those are all positive steps of faith. But they don't equate to building a bonfire and burning your oxen. A statement of faith must make a statement. And I'm not talking about rushing out to the nearest tattoo shop or, you know, don't go set fire to somebody else's things that don't belong to you. I want you to think about this, pray about it, and then act on it. What does it look like to burn the ships? What does it look like to make a statement? What does it look like when we say, I'm going to follow Jesus and I'm never going back? We sing this song when we go to baptism when I was growing up. We'd say, though none go with me, still I will follow. The cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back, no turning back. What is the defining moment? What is the statement of faith that you can make that says to the world around you and definitively plants a flag in the soil, a line in the sand that says, I cannot go back. Well, Michael and Maria Durso, they're now the pastors of Christ Tabernacle in New York City. It's one of the amazing flagship churches in New York City. And in their 20s, they were as far from God as you can get. They mocked everything having to do with God, and they were living together, living in addiction. And one day, Maria, while she was away on vacation, came under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. She wasn't at church. She wasn't reading the Bible. She was in a hotel room on vacation, and conviction came out of nowhere. Well, she learned when she came home from vacation that a group of her friends had gotten saved, and they formed a prayer circle and were praying and interceding for her at the exact same moment that she came under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Well, when Michael and Maria Durso returned to New York from their vacation, they stopped sleeping together, and they started going to church together. And Michael knew he had to have a defining moment. He, he knew he needed to make a statement. So he took all of his drug paraphernalia, along with his porn magazines and all of his videos, and he sent them down the incinerator chute of his New York City apartment building and burned them. Now, Michael Durso made a statement of faith. He put a period on the end of his last chapter. He committed to plan A and got rid of what was plan B. He burned the plows. He burned the ship. And I'm here to challenge you to make a faith statement. A statement of faith must make a statement. So later today, as we get ready to our respond time, I want you to think about it. I want you to pray about it. And then act on it. This is what we do when we do our respond time. We say, God, what are you saying to me? And then what am I going to do about it? What is God, what is the last chapter that needs to end in your life? What is the thing where I haven't fully surrendered to the Lordship of Christ? And I know God's calling me into the next thing, but I got to put a period on yesterday and not a comma. Sadly, too many of us get comfortable with comfort. We follow Jesus to the point of inconvenience, but no further. And this is when we need a prof prophet to walk in into our lives and put a mantle on our soldiers. We need a prophet to boldly confront plan B and call us back to plan A. In our last bit of time together, I want to talk about the double anointing that Elisha inherited because of his all-in moment. Elisha actually lived in the valley of Abel Mahola. In English, that's the, the meadow of dancing. It, and it was known as the breadbasket of the Jordan River Valley. Elisha's family had an amazingly productive and profitable farming operation. Most farms would have one set of oxen. 
As we read in the scripture, Elisha had 12 sets of oxen. And he had the farm hands to plow with. So Elisha comes from wealth. He had all of that to inherit. Burning the plows was more than quitting his job. It was divesting himself of his family share. He was writing himself out of the family will. Elisha walked away from provision. He walked away from comfort. He walked away from success to pursue God's calling. And from the world's perspective, Elisha took a step back in his career. All of his friends could have smirked and talked about Elisha. What's he doing? Why is he giving up such a posh lifestyle? But when Elisha burned the plows and removed plan B, he opened up the floodgates of heaven's anointing. People tend to hedge their bets, not Elisha. He was 100% committed to following Elijah. This gave him the boldness to ask for a double portion of Elijah's anointing, and God granted it. 60 years of prophetic ministry later, and 28 miracles, it was two times Elijah's 14. So my question is, what gave Elisha the boldness to ask for a double portion, the double anointing? And I think it's the simple fact that he was all in. If you give all of yourself to God, you can expect God to give all of himself to you because that's exactly what he wants to do. Elisha could have lived out his entire life in comfort and wealth, and so could you. You could play it safe instead of stepping out in faith. You could protect your reputation instead of risking it. You could keep plowing your fields instead of listening and following the call of God. You might be forfeiting your double portion of anointing. You would miss your miracles. The anointing is the difference between what you can do and what God can do. What you need and what I need more than anything else is an anointing from heaven to unlock what I cannot do on my own. Elisha is one of the great prophets. Elisha was a man of miracles. Elisha raised the dead twice. I want to challenge you, don't let plan B keep you from your plan A. Burn the ships. Make a faith statement. When you do, you're going to release heaven's favor into your life. And you release the difference between what you can do and what heaven can do. I want you to pray with me. Jesus, I thank you now that as we get to this moment of response, I believe that you're calling us. You're, you're drawing us to go all in. That we're not going to live lives that are halfway. We're not going to buy into the gospel without selling out. We're going to sell out. And I pray now that we could have those moments where we burn the ships, where we burn the plows, where we, we say goodbye to plan B and we cling, there's only plan A. Jesus, we don't ask you to follow us. We're surrendering our lives now to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. What an amazing message from Pastor Will. We never like to close a service without giving you the opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of your life. For me, everything changed when I made this decision. So if that's you, you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life, then would you say this prayer with me? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Repeat after me. Jesus, I come to you just as I am and confess my sins to you. I believe you died on the cross for me. I will no longer be bound by guilt or sin. I declare that your sacrifice on the cross has set me free and I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I repent of my sins and trust in you alone as my hope of salvation. Through faith in your resurrection from the dead, I declare that I am a new creation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
If you just said that prayer, we would love for you to fill out your response card so we can help you with your next steps. This is your church home now, and we cannot wait to see you next week. you my-